how to start. Professor Ken Anderson is really a giant in our field. Uh, I, it, it can take me a few hours to read all of his achievements, all the major awards he already received. Actually, we really feel privileged and humbled that he has accepted our small Comey Award compared to all the other prestigious award he has already received. Uh, Professor Anderson probably can be considered, and maybe it's not a good translation from, Fran from French, but we would call him in French as the father of modern multiple myeloma therapy. Uh, I think he has really uh, initiated the whole revolution that we are living today in the field of myeloma. Uh, his work, his continuous work, because it didn't finish yet, we really still need you, Ken, uh, has really uh, allowed to achieve all of these huge survival advantages that we have seen. And since we all agree with Vince yesterday showing that we're still, there's still no plateau, so we still need uh, Ken Vision actually to help achieve uh, this uh, plateau. So I think I don't need to highlight more how much we are honored and privileged having Ken on a, such a short trip just coming to give us this uh, pioneering lecture. Ken, thank you very much. Uh, no, I do want to thank uh, the organizers very much for this honor. Um, I do think when you, when you hear the word lifetime achievement, you wonder whether that means it's time to go. <laughs> uh, but I, hopefully uh, it isn't quite that time for me, because as was said, and I, Vincent said it uh, yesterday, and I think it's obvious we've made so much progress, but we have much uh, more to do. So let me, um, here's my conflicts of interest. I, my myeloma journey started in 1973. And this is Dr. Richard Humphrey, who was my first professor at Johns Hopkins, who taught me the two lessons that are on this slide. Make science count for patients and treat patients as family. It turns out he was a myeloma doctor. And that, honestly, is the first time I had ever heard the word myeloma. And during medical school and during my house staff years from 1973 to 80, I worked in his laboratory, uh, first exposure to myeloma. I went up to Dana-Farber Cancer Institute as a hematology fellow and medical oncology fellow in 1980. And believe it or not, monoclonal antibodies were new back then. At that time, T cells were e at positive, monocytes stuck to plastic, and B cells were surface immunoglobulin positive. And I was part of a team that generated a variety of antibodies here, B4 and CD19, B1 and CD20, the T cell antigens, etc. But we used them in the laboratory and we used them in the clinic to try to identify the normal cellular counterparts of the various malignancies. In the 1980s, we also used them to try to uh, treat patients. So, for example, we would purge bone marrow of patients uh, when we used to do bone marrow transplants, autologous and myeloma, we used to remove the T cells from allografts to abrogate GVHD, and we made a number of immunotoxins. <clears throat> from the 1990s really to now, what we've been focusing on in our group are the tumor host interaction and its important pathogenesis and treatment. Cytokines, which previously hadn't been known, uh, were discovered, and there's a variety listed there. When that happened, then there was the possibility to understand the pathways that mediated the various phenotypes of growth survival and drug resistance. And then came about the idea of making models in order to identify and validate targets and targeted therapies. So myeloma, as you know, is a paradigm for the tumor in the microenvironment because all of us in this room know and have contributed in major ways to targeting the tumor cell itself the interaction between the tumor and the microenvironment and the microenvironment. The first advance, and we were very involved in the preclinical, and Paul told you about the translational components, 
in myeloma were the proteasome inhibitors. Bortezomib went forward initially because it was to inhibit NF-kappa B. By bortezomib inhibiting the proteasome, it blocked the degradation of I-kappa B, which inhibited NF-kappa B activation, which abrogated growth and survival of myeloma. There also were other effects, however, the tumor and the microenvironment. You all know this well. For example, in the microenvironment, osteoclast uh, apoptosis was induced, and adhesion molecules were impacted by virtue of NF-kappa B interruption. The second class of drugs that came around in the late 90s, and, uh, and in fact we studied preclinically, were the immunomodulatory drugs. And there are many people that were involved in these studies. I'll just remember for a minute here Faith Davies, uh, Susanna Lynch, Teru Hidashima, many others that are now the stars in myeloma. But in fact, the class of drugs was different because not only did it have direct caspase 8 mediated apoptosis, but it abrogated adhesion, it abrogated the induction of cytokines, angiogenesis. And in fact, these immunomodulatory drugs augment in patients, which we did in the old days. We would take T cells, NK cells, or NK T cells from patients and show that after imid treatment, they could actually kill their own tumor. Most recent studies show that the imids downregulate regulatory T cells as well. I already mentioned to you that I started working on monoclonal antibodies in 1980, and I'm sure there are some in this room that may not have been very old uh, that year. But in any event, we've been looking for myeloma antibodies that mediate ADCC, CDC, or trigger death or block agonistic pathways for a long time. This is just a partial list, but the two that you know very well, and I'll mention briefly later, daratumumab and elatuzumab are the first, but they're by no means the last, and I'll give you some of my thoughts on that in a minute. But besides the proteasome inhibitors and the imids and the <coughs> monoclonals, the other area that we've worked on uh, are the HDAC inhibitors, and this actually flowed from the work inhibiting the proteasome because this other pathway, as Enrique Osio told you so nicely this morning, the so-called agrosome pathway can compensate when you block the proteasome, there's activation of this pathway and degradation in an alternative mechanism. He told you about the story of panabinostat. We've been involved in making a selective HDAC6 inhibitor, which has a, a very favorable side effect profile, and it's useful here because HDAC6 binds to the protein that's ubiquinated and binds to the dynein microtubule complex, which is responsible for shuttling the protein to the agrosome. So if you block the proteasome inhibitor and the HDAC inhibitors, uh, you get dual blockade. So here's the scorecard. This has been shown several times today. Proteasome inhibitors, the IMIDs, the monoclonal antibodies, and the HDAC inhibitors, all of them tested in R and other models in the, in, uh, the microenvironment, laboratory, and animals all of them moving very quickly into clinical trials and now used at all stages of multiple myeloma. Multiple FDA approvals, Paul now has 20 on his slide, I need to recount things, but in any event, it's remarkable. When I first started in 1973, patients were living only a few months with multiple myeloma. Now, in fact, it's at least eight to 10 years and it's probably much longer because we're not appreciating the value of the new drugs. This is from Shaji Kumar. On the left-hand side is the timing of the approval of those four classes of drugs, and on the right-hand side is, in fact, the median survival as it's improved up till 2010. But again, it's likely to be much higher because we haven't really appreciated the value of the new advances. So that's what we've done up until now. What are we doing now? Well, I wanted to just mention, and I did talk about some of this at the International Myeloma Workshop, in my opinion, three areas of great promise involve further modulation of protein homeostasis, what can we do about the host immune system in myeloma to restore anti-myeloma immunity, and what are we going to do in this very complex genetic disease we call multiple myeloma. So firstly, in terms of blocking protein degradation, many in this room have contributed to blocking the proteasome, initially with bortezomib and now with second generation carfilzomib and exazomib. We and others are interested in blocking upstream of the proteasome the same pathway, the ubiquitin proteasome cascade, 
but the concept here is to block upstream so that you can overcome proteasome inhibitor resistance. And there's two targets that we're currently focusing on. One's called the ubiquitin proteasome receptor. When you have ubiquitinated uh, protein, the UPR, as we call them, brings this complex to the proteasome, so it's the welcome wagon, if you will. The other thing we're focusing on are the so-called deubiquitolating enzymes. As it turns out, once a protein is ubiquitolated, it's targeted for degradation. But in order for this protein to bind to the 20S core of the proteasome and be degraded, the ubiquitin needs to be taken off. So if you block that taking the dub, uh, with dubs, in fact, you're blocking upstream of the proteasome. So here is the ubiquitin receptor proteasome, uh, ubiquitin protein, ubiquitin receptor story. We actually have a prototype drug, RA190 here, that blocks the recruitment of ubiquitinated protein to the proteasome. This is uh, shown here. These are five patients' cells whose myeloma has the nerve to be resistant to proteasome inhibitor bortezomib. And you can see that in a dose-dependent way, there is killing of these cells by blocking upstream of the proteasome. And there's a massive accumulation of ubiquitinated protein because you're blocking the same pathway. Uh, this is the positive control. Well, that is also illustrated here with the dubs. These are blocking the taking ubiquitin label off the protein. And the first example is USP7. Again, here are five of our patients, or six, I guess, whose myeloma is resistant to bortezomib, but they're sensitive to this deubiquitolating enzyme inhibitor. This is Bob Orlowski's bortezomib-resistant cell line that's sensitive to this inhibitor. And I'm proud to tell you that as we're sitting here this afternoon, we actually have the first in-man clinical trial of a dub inhibitor, USP14 UCHL5 inhibitor, in the clinic, uh, we together with Memorial Sloan Kettering, Kettering and Ola Langren. This inhibitor, just to make the point again, does not block the proteasome. Here's Bortezma blocking the proteasome. It doesn't block the proteasome because it's working upstream. It nonetheless causes massive accumulation of ubiquitinated protein. And the exciting thing is we do have some early responses even in proteasome inhibitor resistant myeloma. Now what about further in terms of protein degradation? You all know and you've heard oops, about the IMIDS triggering protein degradation in the past. And you know that this was learned long after we and others were using proteasome uh, IMIDS in the clinic. But thalidomide, lenalidomide, and pomalidomide bind to the cerebellum complex and in so doing turn on proteasome degradation. So we're turning it on instead of blocking degradation. And the classic substrates are Icarose 1 and 3 with downstream effects on hallmark substances such as IRF4 and CMIC. Well, I, one of the most exciting things I've ever done, I think, and, and I uh, hope will really bear fruit, is shown on this slide. This concept has been capitalized on what's called degronomids. So the idea here is that we can use medicines that look like imids, or some of them really don't look like imids, they can bind to cerebron or they can bind to other ubiquitin-3 ligases. But the, the concept is that you then label substrates with ubiquitin. And what's different is you can label the protein you want to degrade. So you can turn on the God-given proteasome degradation system for substrates, whether they be on the cell surface, cytosol, etc. And we now have de degronomids for EGFR, BTK, Roma domain 4. We have them for the dubs and the ubiquitin proteasome receptor. And I don't know how well this will work. There's none in the clinic yet. But if you think about it, if you get rid of the abnormal gene product, just maybe you don't have to worry about all the mutations and other events that are occurring genetically. If you remove the protein, perhaps you're going to get rid of the disease. And we're pursuing this not only in cancer and myeloma, but infectious disease going after the core protein of hepatitis B and hopefully someday, for my case, uh, get rid of the tau protein in Alzheimer's disease as well. Recently we found another target for, for the image and we did it by a pull-down experiment shown here. Here's cerebron, so pomalidomide binds to cerebron, but it binds to another protein called TP53 receptor kinase. So, 
thalidomide doesn't bind, pomalide doesn't, pomalide does bind, thalidomide doesn't bind, what's going on with this new substrate? Well, I haven't time to show you the data, but pomalidomide here acting through cerebellum and turning on proteasome degradation. But pomalidomide also inhibits this PP53 receptor kinase. In so doing, it blocks P53 activation, upregulating E2F and BIM and causing death of myeloma. There's also inhibition of a new substrate, RRM1, and upregulation of P18. The point I just want to make here is that we're only at the beginning of understanding how these imids work. And we are now trying to figure out what is the significance of this other pathway. Could it be that this pathway could be activated and perhaps even when the cerebellum mechanism isn't working, we could try to restore activity through this pathway. Time will tell. So that's all I'm going to tell you about protein uh, uh, homeostasis as a target, but certainly we in the myeloma community have validated that system for the very first time in medicine as a real uh, therapeutic exploitable pathway. Now in the monoclonal antibody era, I showed you that we've been working on this since 1980. The role that we had in the elituzumab story was actually bench to bedside. Uh, we and others noticed this antigen, initially CS1, now SLAMF7, on patient cells and myeloma cell lines and did a variety of studies to show what its role was pathophysiologically in the microenvironment. This led to a clinical trial that you all know showed stable disease of single-agent humanized monoclonal antibody elituzumab. And in fact, usually that would end drug development. Dr. Tai in our laboratory did add in lenalidomide to elituzumab and showed that ADCC was markedly elevated and then it went forward with primarily Sacralonial in the phase two, and again, his leadership along with Thanos Demopoulos in the phase three trials, showing that elituzumab, lenalidomide, dexamethasone was superior to Lendex, leading to its approval. But the concept here is a monoclonal antibody and combination immune therapies. Here is our uh, 1980s work. This is a paper that is from 1984. When I was getting ready for this talk, I, I found this right next to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but in any event, it's old paper, so the work had to be done in the early 1980s. And the only reason I show it to you is these are the various antibodies again, and we identified their expression on cancer. But the one I want to point to is T10. T10 is what is now called CD38, and in fact, we found it on myeloma cells down here in the early 80s. The reason we didn't go for it is because we found it on so many other cells too. Activated immune cells and endothelial cells and progenitor cells, so wrongly we didn't go for it. But when Daratumumab came along, <coughs> along with Torben and some of his team and others, uh, we worked together, and this is work uh, with Dr. Tai together with uh, Dr. DeWeers, showing that lenalidomide, as one example, could augment the killing uh, mediated by daratumumab. There were many other features that were studied, and you all know this just with Thanos Demopoulos' study here, that in fact, if you combine lenalidomide with daratumumab, you get incredible benefit in terms of progression-free survival, and especially in the MRD negative situation, it looks to be very, very promising indeed. Now, I don't think that's the end of the story for combination therapies with, my, with the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, Enrique mentioned this morning, uh, and it has been studied, Atra can upregulate CD38 on myeloma cells and thereby enhance sensitivity to daratumumab. Our HDAC6 selective inhibitor can do the same thing. It actually has two roles. One is it upregulates CD38 on the cell surface of the evil myeloma cell, but it also activates and stimulates immune effector cells. So here is killing of a patient's own myeloma cell in the presence of daratumumab. Uh, this with uh, the HDAC inhibitor alone, daratumumab alone, and the combination. So this is just illustrating, I think we've only begun to appreciate the potential of combination therapies, I like combination immune therapies, uh, at the present time. Now, with all respect to elituzumab and SLAMF7 and CD38 and daratumumab, I'm not sure we have the best target yet. 
BCMA, it seems to be very uh, appealing, B cell maturation antigen, because it's expressed only on myeloma and plasma cells. And we're targeting it in, in several different ways already. One of them is BCMA antibody has been targeted or linked to R-statin immunotoxin. And so, as shown here, what you have is killing by the antibody with ADCC and ADPC, but you also have the delivery of this immunotoxin. And this agent is in phase uh, one, two clinical trials. There are also so-called BCMA bites, and I know many of you in the room have worked on these, as have we. But the concept here is to deliver again to myeloma by virtue of BCMA expression, T cells by virtue of a CD3 here, and hopefully in so doing to have a localized immune response selected to BCMA. One of the targets or ligands for BCMA that's at high levels in your patient's myeloma bone marrow plasma is called April. And so why can't we at least think about targeting the ligand? It's one of the natural activators of BCMA signaling, which is NF-kappa-B growth survival and drug resistance again. And so we are very excited about this. Um, April is made by osteoclasts and macrophages. It binds to the myeloma cell by BCMA. It causes growth survival and drug resistance. Even worse, it upregulates PDL1. So perhaps by blocking April, and there is an antibody now coming to the clinic, we could abrogate the pro-tumor effects and it potentially uh, also restore immune sensitivity as well. So monoclonal antibodies and derivatives in combination. Second thing I want to mention is the checkpoint inhibitors very briefly. PDL1 is on myeloma cells here, and PD1 on CD8, CD4 uh, T cells, NK cells, and NK T cells. More importantly, though, or as importantly, PD1, or PDL1 rather, is expressed on these other cells myeloid derived suppressor cells and plasma cytoid dendritic cells. They're evil. They're in your patient's bone marrow, and they are suppressing the immune system and promoting tumor cell growth. So in myeloma, theoretically, if you use a checkpoint inhibitor, you not only take the break off and allow the immune effectors to activate, you block the effect of these um, accessory cells. In our model systems, just one quick example, this is a patient's own myeloma, their own effector cells. You can see this is viability. It's high here in control. If you add lenalidomide, the effector cells kill myeloma. If you add PDL1, they kill. If you add PDL1 plus lenalidomide, they kill. But this experiment is also done in the presence of autologous plasma cytoid dendritic cells that are trying to block this process. So this is very exciting, and, and you all know that, uh, in fact, combinations are coming. This is killing of autologous myeloma on the y-axis by autologous effector cells. If you add in PD-1 or PD-L1 antibody, lenalidomide, or the combination. This has led and is associated with at least combination clinical trials already. Pembrolizumab PD-1 antibody has been combined with lenalidomide or pomalidomide. Roughly half of the patients are responding 50 and 56 percent respectively, even when their myeloma is resistant to lenalidomide in the former or pomalidomide when you add in PD-1 antibody. So antibodies and checkpoint inhibitors, what about other immune therapies quickly? So vaccines, I want to just mention, we're excited about vaccinating patients against their own myeloma, particularly patients with smoldering myeloma. And we're using a peptide-based vaccine, three targets, XPP1, CD138, and SLAMF7. When we do this, we can get an immune response to every, in all patients. This includes tetramopositivity, type 1 cytokine, tumor selective response. If we add in lenalidomide, combination immune approaches with the vaccine, we augment the responses, and now we're adding in checkpoint inhibitor and our HDAC inhibitor. Why are we doing that? Well, here's the response that we get in smoldering myeloma with the vaccine alone. You can see in the box here, these are tetramer-specific T cells. They're coming up after vaccination, as you can see here, and then they go away. When you add in lenalidomide, you augment that process. 
what about checkpoint inhibitors or the HDAC inhibitor? So what's shown here is autologous T cells on the Y axis killing the patient's own myeloma in the presence of the HDAC inhibitor in blue, the checkpoint inhibitor in red, and the combination. So in other words, if you get an immune response, you can augment it with a checkpoint inhibitor or an HDAC inhibitor in this experiment. And we're hoping when we do the vaccinations that we can get a tumor-specific reaction going and further augment it. Even more importantly, what kind of response do you want to get in your patients? Well, you want to get actually a memory immune response. So here is the same kind of experiment, proliferation of cytotoxic T cells against myeloma, increasing numbers of proliferating CDA positive cells, in this case with the HDAC inhibitor, and importantly, their memory cells, memory, central memory, and effector memory cells. These are the same kind of cells that come when you get vaccinated for tetanus or smallpox and are responsible for your protection. And we're going further just quickly here. If you look at the second generation proteasome inhibitors, the, the protease, yeah, checkpoint inhibitors such as LAG3 at the bottom of this slide, you can see that you can augment CD8 positive selective responses. And over here, you can get the central memory responses against cancer up very high. 92%. The final immune thing I want to mention very quickly are the CAR T cells. Uh, this somehow uh, got modified in translation here, but the first patient treated with a CD19 CAR T cell in myeloma was my patient treated at the University of Pennsylvania, and she had myeloma that was very, very refractory. After transplant, returned very early, and she got a variety of drugs for relapse. And then she got her own CD19 CAR T cell infusion and went into a complete molecular remission that lasted over a year. CD19 is not the right antigen in myeloma. It's only expressed at low levels, if at all, on most myeloma. But BCMA, again, is probably a good one. And this is just one of the studies that we're part of, the so-called Bluebird study with Dr. Berhad is leading this. But this is the BCMA vector 41BB is the co-stimulatory molecule in vitro with gamma interferon secretion as the metric or in vivo in animal models. These CAR T cells are very active against cancer and prolonged survival. But most importantly, in patients presented at the American Society of Hematology, if you get to the right level of cells, 5 times 10 to the 7th or higher, everybody is responding. Still toxicity to deal with, but very exciting. So antibodies, checkpoint inhibitors, vaccines, and CAR T cells. The final comments I want to make are, have to do with genomics. This I got out, Faith Davies in 2003, uh, actually was in our laboratory and just did plain microarray profiling in the old days of normal plasma cells, MGUS, and myeloma. And it just reminds me to say that the majority of changes that we see in myeloma have already occurred in MGUS. There are some changes like RAS mutations, etc., but the most of them have already happened by the time MGUS has arrived. You may have shown, seen this from Nikhil yesterday, but he has been leading our efforts where we've been trying to study, as have many of you, the evolution that occurs in this genomic program over time. You can relapse here with a sim clone that you started with. You can relapse with a clone that has a subclone. You can relapse here with a more predominant subclone than before, or here's somebody that had a clone and a subclone. The subclone went away, and the new clone here came up. What's really humbling to me is shown on this slide. This is again Neil uh, Nikhil shared with me. This is a whole genome sequence on a patient that we saw as a new patient who had 5,300 abnormalities when they came in with their new myeloma. And when they relapsed, they had 12,000 abnormalities, and they weren't the same. So although we, like you, many of you, are trying to target selective pathways in myeloma, we are quite humbled by the prospect of using a single agent or even combinations, for that matter, at the right time and the right place to make a meaningful difference. So what we're doing are two things genomically. One is trying to understand what is the reason for the genetic heterogeneity and complexity that exists initially and the ongoing DNA damage that underlies relapse. And there are four processes that have been identified. 
excess homologous recombination, apex nucleus activity, pan nuclease activity, but especially apobac activity. So we now have new drug screens ongoing together with Nikhil and, and um, Dr. Tomas. The idea here is to screen for drugs that will inhibit these processes and maybe slow down and someday prevent the genetic ongoing damage. The other thing we're trying to do is to try to take advantage of this genetic aberrant program and as a vulnerability treat the consequences of the genomic abnormality. And the couple examples I always like to show, here's an example of something called YAP1, which is down at copy number here in Leukemia and Lymphoma Myeloma. What does that mean? Well, it means that these myeloma cells that are so much DNA damage to start with and it's accumulating all the time, don't die like they're supposed to. And they don't die because under this X, YAP1 is down, is, there's decreased copy number, it's not expressed. And Francesca Patini in our laboratory figured out that in fact a kinase STK4 was responsible for this suppression genetically and now with a small molecule can inhibit STK4 and restore death of these markedly aberrant genetic myeloma cells by a P73 apoptotic mechanism. So someday we may have a kinase inhibitor to exploit this pathway. In patients whose myeloma have really strong amplification for C-MYC, they have a terrible prognosis. And what does that do in the laboratory and to these cells? It actually puts incredible replicative stress on the myeloma. It makes high levels of ROS or oxidative stress. So what we're doing in these patients is blocking with an ATR inhibitor, and we're giving drugs like Velcade that increase the oxidative stress. And fortunately, we make it impossible for them to deal with the stress, and they undergo apoptosis. And the final example is this one. You know, there's a lot about epigenetics nowadays and myeloma and other cancers. Well, what about uh, in myeloma in particular? We're studying a demethylase KDM3A here. And the reason we are excited about it is its activity is increased in myeloma. What does that mean? Well, it takes the methyl groups off the promoters of certain genes, like KLF2, but importantly, like IRF4, which is among public enemy number one in myeloma. So if you block KDM3, which we now have small molecules, you can restore methylation at these promoters, and we call this a fast-forward circuit. You're not impacting just one target, you're impacting multiple important genes and their processes. So what I've tried to say very quickly is give you a little bit of the history of what got me into myeloma in the first place and what's keeping me active and excited every day. And I think these three areas, protein homeostasis, immune, uh, immunity in being restored in the host, and genomic abnormalities as therapeutic targets are among the most exciting. What I do think is that all of us in this room, we really need to keep doing the preclinical science because we can't possibly empirically test all the possibilities we have. We need to use the preclinical science to inform the experiments on the positive side to suggest the good ones and to honestly prevent us from doing what would be needless clinical trials. Proud to tell you the International Myeloma Society is really now coming into its own and is going to really help together with the International Myeloma Working Group to fast forward these efforts. My opinion is when we will cure myeloma is only when we accomplish two things. One, we get to minimal residual disease by drugs and or immune therapies and we in fact in the host restore some kind of immune function in order to maintain that response. Now, just in closing, I have been very, very blessed. Many of my dearest friends are here uh, in this room, and many of them have been friends for decades, and some of them have been trained with us and are now becoming very famous. This is the United Nations Against Myeloma, as you know, and this is just a partial list. Paul Richardson is the clinical leader, and Nikhil Munshi, the laboratory leader, but it goes from bench to bedside and back, and literally we've had numerous individuals who are now professional and personal friends for life as a consequence. This meeting is reflecting something that happened not only recently, the, Interna <laughs> the uh, International Myeloma Workshop in New Delhi, and you can see here a number of your friends that were dressed appropriately uh, at the time. 
But I must tell you, I don't think there's any community that's more unified in their commitment and passion to help patients and make the science count for the patients more than this community. In myeloma, you know, you make really neat long-term friends, role models, and idols. And this is mine right here, uh, Robert Kyle. I guess it's probably well over 50 years, been traveling around the world with him, and he's been an example for me of the importance of patience and the importance of actually helping the next generation of caregivers and researchers. There's no, uh, no one that exemplifies those two concepts better than Bob. This is my family who has put up with me for a long time. I don't understand still why my sons are over six feet, but nonetheless, <laughs> there you go. And this proves that I will do anything to cure myeloma. Uh, this is at the International Workshop. Uh, many of you were also having such uh, turbans or whatever on here. This is my wife and I, uh, and she is honestly, the, you know, what can you say? She's at the center of everything that I do, work-wise and family-wise. So in closing, I just want to thank you very, very much. Um, a lifetime award sometimes means it's time, I guess, that you can wind down, but I assure you I'm actually just warming up. Thank <laughs> you.